Welcome to part three of Getting Started with CMC. Hi, I'm Randy Johnson, and in this section, I'm going over the basics of how to design and machine a 3D relief carving. Creating a 3D relief carving uses design tools that are very different from the ones used in the previous project. So it has its own learning curve. However, 3D carving opens a huge world of possibilities. The basic workflow for 3D carving is the same as other types of CNC work, although some of the details along the way are different. One of the big differences is that the main design element is a 3D model rather than a piece of clip art or vectors. But you start the project the same as any project, setting up the job size, as well as the Z0 position, the XY datum, and then saving it. The first thing that I'm going to do is to bring in the 3D clip art. In the 3D tab at the bottom of vCarve, when you click on it, it opens up a 3D library. And when you open that, you then have a group of categories. Now, there's a lot of free clip art that comes with vCarve, but which ones you have will depend on which version of vCarve you have. For this one, I'm going to click on the animal category and scroll down until I get to this 3D model right here that I want to use for my barbecue sign. The one that's shaped inside the dish, clicking on that will bring the model into the drawing area. I need to increase the size of it a bit. So I'm going to click on the drawing tab, use the set size tool, and then enter the size that I wanted. So in this case, I've entered a height, a width of uh, 12 inches, I've linked the X, Y, and it automatically scales the height proportionately. I've also left the Auto Scale Z checked, which will automatically scale the thickness of the model also. This looks good, so I can click Apply and then Close to exit this window. I can preview what the 3D model looks like in the 3D View tab, and I can see the dish shape, the thickness of it, I want to make a couple changes to this, so I'm going to click inside the Modeling tab, which shows me my list of models. They're called Components, and if I double-click on it, it will open up the Component Properties window, which is an editing window that allows you to change the properties for that particular model. The one that I'm interested in is the shape height. It's currently set at a little over a half inch, and I want to change that to three-eighths of an inch. So when I type that in, the model will automatically change in thickness so that it's half the thickness of my overall material. I'm good with that, so I can close out of that window and go back to the 2D window as well as the drawing panel. Next up, I want to add an ellipse around the outside or an oval line around the outside of this shape. So I'm going to use the Draw Ellipse tool, open that up, and the first thing is I want to anchor the middle of my ellipse to the middle of my material, which is 0, 0, the same as the data point. Next, I need to enter the dimensions for the height and the width of that oval. The model is currently selected, and I can tell that because it's dark in color. And when you have an object selected in your drawing area, the dimensions of it show up at the bottom, and there I can see the width 12 by just a little under 10. These are the same dimensions that we saw inside the set size tool. So to make the oval, I'm going to simply round it up and make it 12 by 10 inches and click create, which inserts the vector for the oval or the ellipse all the way around the model. I'm good with that so I can exit out of that window. Next, I want to add the text for this project. So I'm going to open up the text tool. Enter in my text, select a font, do the alignment, as well as set the size, and it looks good, so I can click Close. But I want this text to wrap along that curve, so I'm going to use the Text on a Curve tool. When I open that up, it instructs me at the top here to select a single line of text, which I've selected. Next, I need to select the curve to wrap it onto. So I want it to wrap it onto this oval or this ellipse that I created. So I'm going to hold the shift key down on my keyboard and then click on this oval, which will automatically wrap the text down to it. 
Now I want this text to move up. I want this to be off that edge. I want it to be more on my model. So I'm going to use this offset distance option up here, enter a half inch, which automatically moves the text up onto the model further. Also, I noticed the letters are pretty close together. So I'm going to go up beneath text spacing, click on that slider bar, and then use the roller wheel on my mouse to slide it up and increase the spacing on the letters. That looks good, so I can close out of that window. Next, I want to import the bitmap to trace for the flames at the top. So I use the same import bitmap tool as before. Bring in the bitmap which happens to be just a little pencil or pen drawing that I did on a piece of paper. I took a picture with my cell phone and then brought it into my computer and imported it into this VCarve drawing. I'm going to use the trace tool that we used before, which will trace around the pencil sketch. Everything looks good after previewing it, so I can click Apply. Now back in the main window, I want to clean this drawing up a little bit. So I'm going to go inside the node edit mode and use the Bezier curves to clean it up till I get it the way I want it. This is the same technique that we used at the end of part one video. Now that I have the vectors for the flames, for the text, my 3D model is set up, the thickness of the 3D model is set up, the dimensions are all set up, I have my oval set up, I'm ready to move over to the toolpath side by clicking up here. The three toolpaths that I'll be using for this carving include the V-Carve toolpath as well as two 3D carving toolpaths. The first one is a roughing toolpath for 3D carving. The second one is a finishing one. I'm going to be using the 3D roughing one first. When I open that up, I get my edit window for that 3D machining toolpath. I'm going to select my tool, and in this case, I'm going to use a half inch, half inch end mill, set it to a tenth of an inch deep, 40% step over, and then my feeds and speeds are set up for the machine that I'm using. So I'll click on select. Next, I need to set up what's called the machining limit boundary. That's the limits to which the machining for this tool path uh, will reach, or they need to stay inside that boundary. For this case, I'm going to use this vector that I've created, the oval or ellipse around the outside, and click on Selected Vectors. That way the machining will stay inside that area. I also need to set up what's called Machining Allowance, and this is the amount of material that's left on top of the project after you rough carve it, and that small amount is then removed with the finishing toolpath. For example, in this picture here, you see the rough tool path, what's left over, and then the finishing tool path comes right back down to where the model is. So the machining allowance is the small amount, it's the minimum amount that's left on top of the material. Next up, I need to set up the roughing strategy, and in this case, I have two options, a Z-level roughing and a 3D raster roughing. I generally use the 3D, or rather the Z-level roughing, because it's much quicker than the 3D raster roughing. I also want to add some ramp to the plunge move for this bit. So I'm going to set that at one inch and also give it a name and hit calculate. So back in the 3D view, we now see the usual blue lines for where it's cutting in the wood. The light blue is the ramping action. The red lines are where the router bit is moving up in the air from between cuts. And we can preview it. And there we see the Z-level roughing toolpath. Close out of this. Next, we want to set up the 3D carving path. For this, I'm going to go into the library, the tool database, select a ball nose eighth inch. And the step over is the important setting in here or one of the important settings. And generally, somewhere between 7 and 11% is a good setting to use. Anything more than 11%, you're going to have noticeable machine marks. And anything below 7%, you're not going to have a noticeable improvement, and it's going to take uh, an exceptionally long amount of time. 
So for this one, I'm going to use something kind of in the middle, rate at 9%. Select. Same as with the roughing tool path, I need to select this vector and use selected vectors so the finishing tool path will stay within that oval. I'm going to use a raster machining strategy for this one, which will be a back and forth left and right action. The offset one is sort of a spiral action starting the middle going out, but for this one, the raster will work fine. Give it a name and click Calculate. So back in the 3D view now, we see all blue lines here, and that's because the tool paths are so close to each other, we don't see through them. So it's a very dense grouping of tool path lines. We can preview it and see the finished design. Now this has been carved with an eighth inch ball nose. The details are pretty good actually. We're done in this window, so we can close out, go back to our 2D window, and then open up our V-carve tool path. Next, we need to select the lines that we want to carve. So I'm going to select the flames and the text. I'm using a 60 degree V-bit for this one. I like a 60 degree when I'm dealing with fine detail like this because it cuts deeper than a 90 degree bit. So it makes it appear bolder, even though it's not any wider, but it is deeper. The rest of the defaults I can leave alone for now. At the bottom here, however, there is a checkbox next to what's called Project Tool Paths onto the 3D model. When you check that, what that does, it applies the carving down onto the 3D model that's below it. So in this case, I want the text and the flames to apply to that dish shape. So when I check that, what it does, it actually makes the 3D, or rather the uh, V-carved tool path conform to the 3D model. Give it a name, calculate again. Back in the 3D view again, we can see the tool paths laying in on that dish. And if we preview it, we can actually see how they carve and conform right to the shape of that dish. It's a pretty amazing uh, option within V-Carve. And I use it a lot when I do this type of 3D carving. We can close out of here now. Now I need to save these tool paths so I'm going to go into the save window, use the same option as before, select my first tool path, and click save. I will then repeat that process for all three tool paths. Once they're saved out to my thumb drive, I can then take them to the machine. Once again, if we look at the three G-code files, which are tap files in this case, and then our design file, which is still on the computer, there are two different kinds of files. This is a CRV file, and in this case, this is a TAP file. The CRV or the VCAR file is your master file, as I mentioned before, and you want to protect that, make sure it's saved. Don't lose it, because if you do, you'll have to recreate it from scratch. However, if you do lose the tap files or something else happens to them, you can easily recreate those out of your VCAR file. We're now ready to carve this, so let's hop over to the machine. Having secured the material to the table, I'm now going to put a V-bit into the collet and use that to align the XY data point. I only need to finger tighten it at this point because I'm not going to put any pressure on it. Use the pendant to move it over and then zero it out in the X and Y location. Once that's done, I can remove the V-bit and then install my half inch straight bit that I'm going to use for the roughing pass. And then I'm going to bring the half inch bit down to the material, slide a little piece of paper under it, use the pendant to nudge down to it, and once I reach the paper, I will zero out the Z setting for this bit. I'm going to locate my first file for the roughing.
You'll see as the roughing proceeds, just as we saw in the preview in decarb, it does it level by level. Once the 3D roughing is complete, we're going to switch out the straight bed and install the 8th inch ball nose bed. Having zeroed out the 8th inch bit, I can then look for tool path number 2 and start that and run the 3D finishing path. You'll notice that again, just like as in V-Car, the 3D finishing path is rastering left and right cutting away the material that was left by the 3D roughing pass. Once that's done, I'm going to remove this from the machine and put my first coat of finish on it. But before I do that, I'm going to add a little piece of tape for alignment purposes. I like to finish my MDF projects with several coats of shellac, sanding them nice and smooth to make sure all the rough spots are gone, and a quick brush to clean them up. When I'm done with this, I want this sign to have a weathered aged look to it. So I'm going to start out with this silver tone finish. Once that has thoroughly dried, I'm going to put the board back on the machine, install my 60 degree V-bet, and since I don't want to zero off the project, I'm going to add a little piece of MDF next to the project and zero off that instead. I can now locate my number three file and run it. Once again, as we saw in V-Carve, it's actually following the curve of that dish and applying that V-Carve to the 3D model. Once that's done, I'm going to rub some red paint into the lettering. Once again, pre-finishing the first carving and then carving back into it with the V-carving allows me to more easily rub the fill color off. I'm not too concerned, again, about the slight layer of red that's on top of it. It adds a little weathered look, which is what I want. Plus, I'm going to add a couple more colors to the top of this until I get the sign finished. Thanks for joining me in this three-part series on getting started with CNC. I hope you found it helpful.